I grew up in the slums of Shreveport, Louisiana, too uncomfortable. So I went into the Air Force. I wanted to be the president of the United States. Uh -huh. That was the beginning, fight or flight. There's a science to living. Mm -hmm. Your human factor profile. Knowledge is power. I'm an energy person. Think about how we could eliminate the, the violence in schools right now. So I want to thank you, everybody out there, for coming back for another episode of You Go First. Uh, I'm your host, Lane Hensley, and I am crazy excited today to have uh, a special guest coming at you with a ton of knowledge, some amazing life experience, and has just been a real mentor of mine and somebody that I've watched work with groups over the last oh, 16 years or so. Um, so a good friend and mentor and like I said, somebody who has inspired absolutely an entire generation of, of uh, young people through his work as a professor, uh, through young people with his work with Rotary and the, uh, the Camp Royal or Rotaract experience. And so with that, I want to just start out by just sending it out there, a, a big welcome and people in studio, you can clap if you want for Dr. Robbie Dodson here with us today. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, so Robbie, so the theme is you go first. And the idea is that we're trying to give people information, inspiration, you know, uh, perspective on how they can, they can go first in their lives to make change happen. Where can they go first if they have the tools or in, inspiration to go first and the courage to do that? Uh, and just a little info about Dr. Robbie Dodson. He is, of course, he has his PhD in psychology. Uh, BS in business management, uh, MA in correctional psychology, as an AA in political science and history. You've worked in Hollywood helping develop movies. You had a radio show, one of the first black uh, radio show hosts as a psychologist. Uh, University-wise, you've been at Stanford University, uh, you know, University of Hawaii, Hawaii Pacific University, U.S. Air Force Academy. I mean, the list is just on and on and on. I know you've given over 700 keynote speeches around the world. Uh, and so just so thankful to uh, be a friend of yours and to have your guidance from me and happy to share you with our audience today. So knowing all those credentials that you have, uh, and I know you have a lot coming up uh, with how you're going to use your, your experience and your knowledge to help impacting the world. But let's start with, you know, tell us a little about Robbie. Where were you born? What was life like as a kid? And how did you get from wherever you started to working for two presidents and, you know, managing a billion plus uh, uh, budget at the Pentagon? So uh, where did it start? And um, let's talk about that first. Well, <laughs> well, I'm pretty how do you say I'm, I'm in a situation where I'm humbled and honored that anyone would just care about who I am and how I came to be. Um, for some reason, uh, I was a kid who was the oddball in the sense that I would spend a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to be in the future. And uh, I lived in the, I grew up in the slums of Shreveport, Louisiana, where it was a very dismal time. Mm -hmm. I was born in 1946, right after, well, right after the war. And um, so living in Louisiana for my family wasn't easy. You know, I remember um, that experience. But I knew it was a place that I didn't want to be. It was too uncomfortable. I didn't feel good enough. I didn't feel um, that I had the opportunities. Uh, uh, my mother was working three jobs. She'd get up in the morning and go pick cotton. She'd come back in the uh, six or seven in the morning. She's out uh, picking cotton from three o'clock or so forth. They'd ride a bus out, and then they'd ride a bus back, and somehow she would go to a, deli a delicatessen, and uh, blacks couldn't go in the front of the Wow. The delicatessen, she'd have wow. to buy food out of the back. So she would buy the ham bones and different things that are left over from the restaurant. Wow. And she'd come home and uh, she would make the breakfast. And we'd wake up to the smell of biscuits. And, you know, we, even though we lived in the slums, my mother created a middle class environment inside of our home. Hmm. So we didn't know that we were poor. We didn't understand the circumstances with which she had to deal and she would wake up, we put on nice clothes, uh, pressed and ironed, um, have breakfast just like a regular family. 
And then uh, we'd go off to school. Once she'd go off to school, she'd do whatever she had to do around the house, and then she would uh, work in the grocery store. And she would bag groceries, and she'd ride a bike to deliver it to the the white families that needed it, and so forth. And uh, we'd go to school. She insisted that we do well in school. She taught my brother and I to uh, read at the age of three. And she felt that it was necessary because when you're educated, you know, that eliminates ignorance. And it also helps to eliminate the control people have over you mm. because you don't know. So as a result of, a result of that, she, she pushed education. So we came home from school, we were latchkey. She would come home, make lunch for us, go through our homework, and then she'd go back to work until about six or seven, wow. come home. Uh, she would make a nice meal, check our homework. Uh, we bathe and whatnot, uh, do a little bit more homework. We read the scriptures and whatnot. And after she put us to bed, then she would take she would take in other people's ironing. She would iron clothes and whatnot at night. So that was her routine. And in addition to that, she was a domestic. And uh, she and my grandmother would uh, uh, work in a in a home for a family. Uh, they were Italian. And uh, when the father died, the mother died shortly thereafter. And there were four kids. And uh, they took those kids in. I mean, they paid the mortgage on the home, uh, looked wow. after those kids. So we grew up uh, with a white family. Plus, my family is mixed as well. So uh, we'd have to ride the bus to the neighborhood black school, which may be four or five miles away, and the kids could walk up the street to school, but we'd all meet at home. So I grew up without prejudice and without uh, feeling inadequate outside. But I always wanted to excel. I wanted more education for myself. And uh, my my secret dream that I could never talk to anybody about is I wanted to be the president of the United States. Uh-huh. But that's something you couldn't talk about in the community because people will laugh at you. You know, you're never going to go to college. No one's ever done that. So um, having that kind of a background, I kept that internal to myself. But I did well in school. I was I graduated number seven in my class of 271 kids, so I was pretty bright. And uh, as a result of that, uh, it was a platform for me to continue my education. Thinking that I was going to get a scholarship to college, uh, I only had $30. <laughs> but I, had a, I felt like I had a great mind, so I qualified to, for Southern University. So I was going to get a scholarship but some kid with the same name got the scholarship. Oh. <laughs> so we're sitting around <laughs> waiting for this letter in the mail of acceptance that never came. Yeah. So I went into the Air Force. And the Air Force was probably one of the best decisions I could have made because it got me in a place where I could fulfill my dreams and I could be someone. And uh, after I'd been in the military for eight months, the letter came that I had received a scholarship. So naturally, I said, oh, I'm happy. So I just let the people know in the Air Force that, hey, I'm going. I'm going back to college. They're probably like, sorry, buddy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what? I mean, we could do a whole show on, honestly, yeah. what you've said already as far as your sure. life growing up. and. Yeah. You know how your mom set that example and sure. and just the belief you had about yourself, like I have a good brain and finding your way in this place. So what happened now? And and when did psychology start to become such a passion well, for you and understanding? Well, that, after so. I had been in for a little while, uh, I was I wanted to go to college after I got through basic training. I, I wanted to go to college. So I um, was stationed in the Philippines and uh, I was sitting down. Uh, shining my shoes in the latrine, and I happened to see a Reader's Digest magazine that was laying there, and it was a, and the title of the article of the cadet that wouldn't quit, and uh, I opened it, and it was about Brigadier General, oh, I'm sorry, Lieutenant General uh, Benjamin O. Davis Jr., and he was the the first black ger- uh, general in the Air Force, and he had gone through the Air Force Academy, and while he was there, his white classmates wouldn't speak to him. In other words, he was silenced for four years, but he graduated in the top of his class. 
His father, though, was Benjamin O. Davis Sr., and he was a, a brigadier. No, he was a major general in the Army. And uh, at the time I read this article, uh, Lieutenant General, that's a three-star, so the ranks are like this, Brigadier, one-star, uh, Major General, two-star, Lieutenant General, three-star, and then full generals, four-stars. So uh, I was so impressed at the fact that he went to the Air Force Academy and he was sil uh, silenced for four years. I wanted to become an officer. That was mm -hmm. my number one goal. My second goal was to get a Ph.D., and my th third goal was to become president of the United <laughs> States. <laughs> so mm -hmm. anyway, that was the beginning. And uh, shucks, you know, I flew in a helicopter in, in Vietnam. Uh, I would take my correspondence courses. I, you know, we flying over the jungle rescuing uh, down pilots or crews or whatever, and I'd be studying my materials, my classroom materials, uh, uh, Right on the, on the aircraft. So was this know, in Vietnam or was Viet, this in a, Vietnam? Wow, Guam, uh, all over the Philippines, uh, all over the what we call the Southeast Asia theater. So uh, Tonsonut, uh, Thailand. Uh, um, wow. Uh, I can't remember all the places <laughs> in uh, in Thailand, uh, Cambodia, and so forth, but. That was the beginning of the education because yeah. education had been instilled in me. It's very important. So my very first degree, AA degree, got at Yuba College in, in Marysville, oh. California. Wow. I was stationed at uh, Beale Air Force oh. Base. And then I went on to uh, get a master's degree and so forth and so on. And uh, one thing that's unique, though, my master's thesis for... Uh, was from uh, Chapman College, is where I went to school there. My master's thesis was used as part of the California penal system. Mm -hmm. It had to do with recidivism. Uh, my professor had uh, asked us to write a paper, and I happened to, to write a paper that he thought was great. And then they ended up, uh, I think Ray, Capuni uh, Ray Pecuniere was the, uh, I believe he was the, over the penal system in California. and. This professor, I can't remember his name now, worked in the, uh, the system somehow, and he sent this up, and there was a little paragraph there. Yeah. Yeah, in the California penal system. So, so that was the beginning of knowing that I could do more than... Yeah. Well, it sounds like you had, obviously, some really big dreams as a kid growing up in yeah, that situation. Yeah. Somehow that was instilled in you as, a, yeah. you know, in the spirit of you go first, your mom was going first to yeah. show you a world beyond yeah. your current circumstance. Yeah. And then... As this path starts to unfold, so you're getting these degrees, you're starting to discover that you have this impact. And then let's fast forward a little to like, okay, now you, you've become a psychologist, you're mm -hmm. working in lots of different areas and using your psychology. Mm -hmm. And my experience mostly with you is in your, your, your profile, your human factor profile. And I know mm -hmm. there's lots of assessments that people use out there sure. from, you know, Myers-Briggs and all the others. But in my experience in the last, you know, like I said, 16 years of seeing you deliver this, this process, you know, most of our listeners are either business professionals or college students, or they're just in significant relationships, or they're young people just trying to figure out what to do with their lives. Tell us a little about the human factor profile, like how, what inspired you to create this tool as briefly as you can, and then sure. give them a little window into what it is and how it can apply to them. Obviously, this won't be even close to enough time sure. to go into those depths. But, you know, as you were a psychologist, then how do you convert into then creating this human factor tool? And what does it mean as they try to use it? Well, I think I'm very pleased that you asked me that question. But I want to go back for just a second. That uh, when I was a kid, there were a couple, there were a couple of things that made me think and act out of the box. And one was my mother would say, "You're so dumb, you don't know you can't do it." That was one number one. And number two is, she says, "I might give out, but I'll never give up." So that let me know that. Anything's possible. Yep. And the fact that my circumstances didn't determine what I could be or what she could be. So fast forward to the psychology thing. Uh, 
when I was very early in my academic career, uh, I didn't know that I had any skills. I knew I had some, but there's no way to pinpoint them. But it just so happens I took the CLEP test. And the CLEP test is a college level um, program where you can challenge. So my first three years of college, I just challenged the test. And I passed the courses. <laughs> I didn't know that I had this innate ability to understand psychological principles. Mm -hmm. So the whole first three years is just Black. I just challenged it, and I, I did well on all the CLEP tests. So in so doing, I discovered a lot more about myself. And in 1981, uh, I, just started to, I started to write about this. By this time, I had two master's degrees. And uh, I knew that people were different. I, I read about Myers-Briggs. I read about some of the other typing theories. I went all the way back to... Hippocrates and 400 BC, looking at the people types, uh, human types, uh, all of these kinds of things. And somehow uh, I felt there was something missing. It was, those were grandiose ideas. These are things that you could hear about and think about, but how do you actually apply this to your regular everyday mm -hmm. life? So I wrote a book, my, uh, my, uh, my doctoral thesis was called uh, contact therapy uh, um, and uh, what it basically did was it indicated that if you couldn't afford uh, therapy you couldn't afford to have your own psychologist who do you turn to to help you overcome situations mm -hmm. in your life and it turns out uh, the boy scout leader you know the bartender the mother the, the pastor a good friend, all of those people had information that could be helpful. So that was the beginning. I developed this. The book sold for uh, for a time. Uh, one of my sons, uh, who uh, happened to be a professor at Harvard uh, right now, he says, Dad, I was in England, and your book's on sale in England. <laughs> and it's been out of print since 1987, <laughs> so that made me feel pretty good. Yeah. But then in 19... I believe 1985, I had the concept of how to create the perfect world. How do you take the typing theories that are out there mm -hmm. that, that demonstrate the individual differences between people? And then start to, you know, I have these thoughts that come to you in the morning and so forth. And they just kept coming and kept coming. So I decided there has to be some scientific principles on which people are different. And I came up with this theory called Psychology is the science of living. There's a science to living. Mm -hmm. And in the science of living, there are things that indicate that we're individually different. We think differently. We process information differently. We have different motivations. We have different uh, reactions to stress. And then there's the, there's the, the reality principle, and then that's the perceived reality principle. So I needed to put all that together in such a way that I could build some kind of a program that was based on experience that a person could do right now. For example, a Myers-Briggs is 350 questions. You take the, you take the assessment. It's, it's someone sends it out and it processes for three weeks to come back and they give you a picture of yourself. For instance, you'll have a Myers-Briggs type indicator, mm -hmm. which is a Myers-Briggs MBTI. And so you'll find out that you're, um, you're an introvert, uh, you have your, your judgment, uh, or something like that. But anyway, you'll have this type code. And then after two weeks, you forget it. But it wasn't anything, you, you know something about yourself, but there's no way to apply it. So I wanted to go a step beyond. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to get into how people think, uh, what motivates them, what brings them self-esteem, what causes them stress and frustration, and then also what makes another person attracted to another. So that was the beginning. And then I guess that it just evolved after that. So now it's called the, the human factor. And I'll talk more about that if you, you want yeah, to. Yeah, I would love that. I mean, you know, and... 
Sure. I, and, and even in the fast session that we do that I've seen you do many times is three to four hours long. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the podcast is obviously, you know, a half hour or so. Sure. Um, so, you know, if we can jump into, you know, so you obviously, you know, find this sort of gap in the thought process from these tools and using sure. your own innate abilities to really assess human behavior, come up with these four, sure. these four human factor types. And for sure. me, you know, I know that there's knowledge, you know, there's structure, there's energy and compassion. Those, Absolutely. Are, the, those, those are the, are the four. four. Yes. And, uh, and, you know, when I've seen it before, I've had the luxury of like my kids have gone through it with you. My mother was there one time. Uh, my father was there one time to see your session. And, you know, these awakenings of like, oh, my gosh, that's why. Sure. Um, and maybe tell us a little, just a little about sure. each of the types. Sure. Like I said, I hope this is just a beginning well, of a conversation we well, can have in future yeah. podcasts. Our personality has four levels, mm-hmm. in my opinion. And see, those four levels... Uh, indicate something about us. See, there is no one specific type. We have what we call a profile code. For example, when you buy a product at a store, there's a little code, a little barcode that tells you all about that. It tells you where to find it. It tells you when it's going to run out, when it's going to be resupplied. So it's a barcode. So we actually are born with a, a barcode. I call it the code of life. Everyone refers to it as the DNA. So our personalities are broken up into parts. For example, uh, my particular innate core value or my human factor profile code would be uh, knowledge, structure, um, energy, and compassion. Now, what does that mean? That top card or that top level, which would be knowledge, that's my innate core value or Mm. factor. What that mean is that I am a knowledge seeker. Uh, Logic drives me, looking at the big picture, uh, seeking knowledge. So in that, it gives me a power, a gift, and a mission in life. That person would be a person who's... uh, driven by the inquiry, the person who's driven uh, for the seek, for seeking knowledge, looking at a way to um, control nature for the benefit of man, uh, developing technologies or concepts. Uh, that person's power would be the power of their intelligence or imagination. Mm-hmm. And their natural gift in life is to advance mankind. Mm-hmm. So that's personally easily, easily, recognized, re- easily recognizable because they're the ones, quote unquote, we look at and call geeks. <laughs> so that's my t- upper level. My second level is my parental innate core value, which would be structure. That means that the person uh, or persons in my life during my formative years taught me my value system. They created the factors that drive that part of me. So my, this, when I say that my innate, uh, my human factor profile code is, is uh, knowledge, structure, uh, uh, energy, and compassion, what I'm saying is that upper level is innate. That's unlearned. I had nothing to do with that. Yeah. The second one was taught and shaped to me by parents or whoever had that parental so role. mom with the iron shirts and the breakfast is ready and going to the, you're the like, okay, structure step by is step. important. I'm yeah. sure she held you to yeah. high standards. And the energy, that's my social core value. That is the environment. Uh, that's the neighborhood. That's the tradition. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are the things that I learned from my friends, my neighborhood, my school. And the last one, which would be compassion, that's the stress in my life. <laughs> okay, so, so what that means is that in life, those upper levels or you're born with are taught um, skill sets, and they're highly developed at the top level. And as you move down, social core level, and then when you get to your bottom level, in my particular case would be compassion, that means I'm stressed in that area when I deal with people or situations that, are, uh, that have to do with caring and nurturing or patience and things of that sort. So 
it, it stresses me. But that means that I need to work on that area. You know, when a person lives to be 60, 70 years old, they learn not to let things bother them. Okay? Yeah. But do you want to wait till you're 70 years old to figure that yeah. out, or do you want to know now? So by understanding what your stress is, you can build that up. You can have more experiences help you develop that. So um, in my particular case, uh, in everybody's case, when you experience stress, you have one or two responses, fight or flight. If your structure or if your structure or energy, you tend to fight to try to manage that stress. Mm -hmm. If your compassion or your knowledge, when you take flight, you t remove yourself from that. So it gives you a little bit of understanding of what they are. Energy, uh, people are the kind that uh, no fear. They're instinctively motivated by action, activity. They're they're spontaneous, loving, uh, sexual. Uh, 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 they love extreme sports. Uh, a compassion person, that's the person that's more social, uh, caring, nurturing, uh, the kind of people who's your best friend. They're motivated by, by, uh, by feelings. They're knowing what's naturally uh, important to people. And then, of course, the structured person is a, is a task-oriented person who is performance-driven. They have a, a task list for everything. They are, it's, they're step-by-step. Step. Yeah. And each one of those things, that's what's important about understanding the difference. Uh, an energy person is what you call an application learner. That means that Anything they learn, they can learn in 20 minutes. And they have to be able to apply it right away. They don't need extensive background. They don't read the whole book, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. A person who has knowledge, on the other hand, that person's what you call a discovery learner. Don't give me the answer. Give me the question. Let me find mm -hmm. my own answer. Because they can think it out. They can solve it. They can use the theory. A structured person, on the other hand, is what you call a direction learner. They naturally understand things when you explain it to them. You go step by step. You present it to them in an organized manner. And a compassion person, what you call a discussion learner, they have to talk it out. It has to be a shared experience where there's a dialogue between the person providing information to them and the person receiving it. So they work together. So does that give you some basic understanding well, of the differences? Yeah, I mean, and it really for our listeners, because I know that, you know, this is the hard part. Like for me, I'm a compassion person. That's my yeah. first. My wife is a knowledge person. So we're good friends, but your knowledge, I'm compassion. And last for me is knowledge. Yeah. And that's my stress. I never feel like I know enough. I haven't mm -hmm. read enough books. I don't have enough information. And uh, my wife wa doesn't, she wants the question and she wants to find her own answer. So, yeah. you know, for people out there, like I think one thing I love about your tools, so simple for people to really get a sense of, wow, when they read through the information, it's pretty obvious, I think, for me at least, to, to say, okay, cool, I'm compassion first, I'm energy, I'm structure, and then I'm knowledge. And then looking at the influences of my life, where the stress is, how do we then, you know, if we want to make this, this perfect world in our relationships and our understanding so we can go first to have a deeper understanding of the, the people who stress us out and why it's like, oh, well, that's why, because they're, they're just a knowledge person and I'm an energy person, I'm ready to go. And they're like, wait a second, well, where are we going? You know, and what's the details? Because their structure might be number two for them. Yeah. So what can you tell us about, you know, how do we learn more about, you know, how to understand those people that are different than us, well, knowing those types? That's a very good question. I want to talk to you about that. Let me just give you a little joke here. The... Compassion person says to the energy person, or let's say the, the compassion husband says to the, the knowledge wife, honey, you don't say you love me anymore. And the knowledge person, the knowledge husband says, I, I told you I'd love you 15 years ago. Should I, re do I need to repeat myself? <laughs> so <laughs> knowledge people, um, they like low maintenance relationships. They like to, to read and to think. And they move away from people to serve people. Whereas a compassion person moves toward people mm -hmm. to serve people. Do you understand? This is the they, beauty yeah. of, honestly, so, my marriage. Yeah. Like, but see, my that, wife is behind the scenes, like, supporting like that. And I'm like, let's get everybody together. Yeah. yeah. But, see, here's the thing. We're not just one. We're a combination of four things. Mm -hmm. What it means is, 
if knowledge just lasts, this is an area you need to work on. Mm-hmm. Because you're going to do one of two things. You're going to take flight or fight to try to manage that stress. But that's your partner, someone you love. So you have to learn this about yourself and bring up those skills. Because the more knowledge you can be with her, the more compassion she can mm-hmm. be with you. Be, we're not just one. We're a combination of things. So we have two influences on our life. We have an innate, unlearned influence, and, then, and that's called nature. And then we have the environmental. That's the learn. That's the part we learn from others, our parents and others. So the environment teaches us some things. And innately, we, we are able to understand some things. That drives us. So first, you have to understand yourself. Once you understand your human factor profile code, now you have to apply it to others. If you go into DMV and it's crowded, And uh, that's a very long line. And one person is going step by step on every form. You have to say to yourself at this time, this is a structured situation. Mm -hmm. If you're structured, you understand. But if you're not structured, you know, if you're compassion, you see people frustrated, that bothers you. Your energy, you want things to move very fast, that bothers you. So you have to be able to adjust mentally and say to myself, this person is this way, therefore I have to change my processing of information about this person and make the change. Mm-hmm. But we live in the moment. Because we live in the moment, we're not able to make the transference and process the information so we experience stress. But if you're able to say, I understand my wife needs this yeah. time alone, and if she's able to say, I see where Lane needs more compassion. He needs a touch. Maybe he needs more conversation. You mm-hmm. see, oh, it's, it's making the application yeah. as the process uh, that's important. Well, in the spirit of like the you go first concept is like, how do we, you're giving us this tool. And what I love about it is it's so simple. Um, I know when my mom and dad went through it, my mom is clearly so compassion. My dad is knowledge and structure. So when mm-hmm. she wants a hug, he's out, you know, cleaning the garage and blowing off the yard to say he loves her. It's a little like the love languages, but it's so much more than that to say it's a really an understanding language to give us a a, a perspective. I understand why their priority is here and mine is there. Who's going to go first to find the middle ground or at least appreciate that that's how they go about, you know, think about it. That's how you create the perfect world. First, I understand and then I apply it. Mm-hmm. And I apply it in such a way that you feel it. So when you're being compassionate to me and I'm compassionate, I feel it. So naturally, I can be knowledge or energy or structure with you because I'm more at ease. See, people only repeat pe- behaviors that make them feel good about themselves. Mm-hmm. See, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I feel good, I can act well and I can make you feel good. But so you have this question of esteeming behavior. We tend to move away from things that de-esteem us and move toward things that esteem us. But if you have a partner uh, in life, you have a partner in business, you have a partner, or even if, if countries, leaders, you know, experience this and applied this, really applied it, we could create the perfect world. Yeah. We could create perfect worlds at home, perfect worlds in communities, in schools. Think about how we could eliminate the, the violence in schools right now. Mm-hmm. How, if, if people care, some yeah. of the people who are reacting are reacting out of stress, de-esteeming situations, because they don't understand themselves and they don't understand other people care about them or how to t- reach them. So that's the difficulty, I, is applying these principles. But seen, first you have to learn the principles. Yeah. I've seen you when you're talking to young people before talk about what the type is that usually ends up with a school shooting and things like that. And I know you've impacted, like I said, the world from the Pentagon to, you know, inner cities to these schools that and these kids that are really trying to understand themselves and the people around them and how sometimes these human factors, like I said, fight or flight takes over. And I know even in this conversation, like I'm feeling emotional, like Mm -hmm. my compassion is so off the charts Mm -hmm. and the like 
intensity of this message that I want to get out to the world mm -hmm. because that perfect world between me and my wife or me and my kids mm -hmm. comes from that understanding and the ability to apply it. And it's so beautiful the way you've put this human factor together. I just want more people to experience yeah. it. So who are the types that you think are most obvious or like I said, who lashes out in the school environment? I, I can't remember which type and how you well, told that before. Well, energy students or people who are energy tend to want to do things right now. And they think fast and they're very decisive. But in a school, you have a very regulated structural system where there's confinement, there are rules, and there's uh, the flexibility is not there. So an energy person has to get up and exercise and move about in 20 minutes. They can't sit still very long. So school is very hostile to them. And what happens when you're hostile? You strike back, you strike out, you swear, you cuss, you fight, those kinds of things happen, okay? But structured students do well in school because they love the structured environment. Yeah. Someone tells them what to do, there's a time limit when you're supposed to do it. Compassion kids seem to do well in school when there's a caring teacher, where there's a dialogue. Uh, energy, uh, um, a knowledge person can do without school because they can read on their own. That they like to move at their own pace. They don't want anybody regulating them. So, but school is very hostile to an application learner who doesn't need all the time. They want to physically, they're skill center, so they need to move toward that. Mm. Whereas, so naturally, they're the ones that kicked out of school for having problems. <laughs> yeah. And what do you do with an energy kid on the streets? They join a gang or something. I yes, know. yes. But the gang members... Uh, who tend to join gangs or compassion kids because mm. sometimes they feel left out or not included. So they tend yeah. to move toward people who would include them and care about them. And sometimes to prove your loyalty and to prove that you're a part of something where you're going to get love back, you engage in activities not so good. Sometimes right. you're going to have... Uh, uh, the teenage pregnancies, you're gonna have the, the small robberies and things, and then you might lead to real serious gang activity. So gang members tend to be uh, compassion kids who connect with energy hmm. because they're naturally kind of connected to each other and they will take on activities of the other. In other, to, in other words, to prove I love you and I'm gonna get love back, I'll do this ugly thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you take knowledge kids. Now, uh, what's beautiful about knowledge, the imagination is beautiful. The imagination, I mean, because we have imagination, we can, we can go to the moon, we can watch, we can control the space shuttle with our watches. Yeah. You know, we have, what, uh, 120 megabytes on our, on our pens, and our phones will have 500 megabytes of information. So that's a beautiful mind. But when that mind is disturbed, for example, the most heinous person on the planet is a knowledge-based person because they tend to move away from people. So they don't feel the sense of caring, the sense of harm they do to people. So it's easy to, to wipe out everybody. I mean, to shoot everybody in the classroom because they were there yeah. and not have remorse because these are people who... Love is a, a low priority for them hmm. in the high stress situations. Wait, now you're a knowledge person, so it's interesting that you're saying that's the. Well, what's the first thing a knowledge person do? They go silent and move away from people mm -hmm. and only think about themselves. They tend to forget about other yeah. people because that's who they are. See, we can't help be who we are until we know about who we are. Mm -hmm. And then we can see when we're moving into these different environments you go into a math classroom you have to actually go into a knowledge state of mind because it's theoretical you go into a history classroom you have to move into a structured state of mind because there are dates and things yeah you go into economics same thing but if you go into history or sociology or psychology then you have to move into you know a yeah. different state of mind well it's so it, it, having to understand yeah. that and when you meet people for example you find a person who's tattooed up that's a person who 
is chances are it's going to be an energy person mm-hmm. because this person likes being noticed and getting everybody's attention. And they are fast paced. They have something to indicate, you know, I'm, I'm sexual, I'm active, I'm fun loving. Mm-hmm. That's who they are. Yeah. Okay, you meet a person who is, you know, who's uh, organized, they're using their, their cell phone or they have a list or something or their, their own time. Uh, they can't, they don't like being held up. They, they can't uh, mm-hmm. stand being late for something. That person is structured. So what do you do in a structured person? You get structured. Yeah. Right? Well, you know, it's so, interesting that like we're talking about schools and stuff, but the conversion <laughs> to then companies and how, how, you know, and it's like you got to have a sales force out there. Yeah. You know, and they're the energy people, right? They're like out in the, in the you know, they're in their car calling on all the doctors or seeing their customers. And all that. You got the knowledge person that's in the lab, you know, creating the new, you got the structured people that are, you know, in accounts receivable and accounts payable. You know, and rules. then you've got your compassion person, maybe HR or the person that's, hey, we need to have a team building and get everybody together. Absolutely. We're feeling, and, and the beauty of these four zones and how, you know, we talk about it at Odyssey about catching yourself being yourself. Yeah. And it's enough to, okay, I caught myself in something and now I have this human factor to look to and then to see now my relationship with the other people and recognizing, oh, I, they're a knowledge person. I'm an energy person. I see where I need to adapt some of my, the way I present or teach them or the way I interact with them in a meeting. That's why they don't want to sit in on a three hour, you know, planning meeting for next quarter. Sure. You know, they, they need short meetings with some interactive time. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I started this with just, there's no way this is going to be enough time. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, can feeling that again. I want to sure. have like, you know, Robbie round two, Robbie sure. round three. Sure to continue to dive into this. Cause I this is like you said, the key to a better world. Like, uh, sure. uh, what was the term you used uh, about a better world or uh, uh, how to create the, the, the perfect, perfect world. world. Yeah. And I think, I think I've heard legend that that's the going to be the title of your book that should Absolutely. come out sometime next right. year. Right. And I like the concept that this perfect world isn't necessarily the, it's the perfect world between us and how that impacts that's the, that's the people next to them. And, in maybe in a, a classroom and then the school and then the neighborhood and then the town, you know, yes, and then exactly. the city and then the, like you said, world leaders, if they understood these things, I think there's a story about Ronald Reagan when he was talking to Gorbachev about taking down the wall and he got to a point where he said, let's take a walk. Yeah. Um, and he recognized that this is a person that we need to change our physiology. This Absolutely. is a person that we've talked enough. Now let's move together as an action person. Sure. Um, so I don't know how to like even close up this cause I feel like we're just starting. So what well, can you say to our listeners to just well, give them something here? We can do better. We can be taller, stronger, smarter, and more caring. We can. And, 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 and I'd like to just speak to managers for a minute. You have a workforce and we tend to, if you're going to change a home or a company or whatever the case may be, it has to start top down, bottoms up. And you should have, you have to recognize people are different. And if you're running a company or a team, try to make sure that each one of those primary innate core values are factored at the table. If you need a plan, guess who's gonna give you the plan? A structured person and step by step. Mm -hmm. You need it moved, you need it promoted, negotiated, that energy person's gonna do that. You need to work out the bugs between people, create the problem solvers. That person needs to be compassion. But if you need to look into the future, how you can develop this, you need the product knowledge to make it stronger. That person needs to be at the table and figure out how you can best use those people. Mm-hmm. You may be totally different. You may be primarily energy, want it all done right now. But if you have a team at the table talking about it, you can do it. It works for governments. It works for armies. You know, it works for community. It works for classrooms. Yeah. I mean, just, just understand people are different yeah. and then treat them differently. I'll close by saying, knowledge is power if you use it. But otherwise, it's just information if you don't. So as a result of that, 
in order to get the best out of others, you have to first understand yourself and then understand them and then act on it. Mm. Yeah, well, well said, Robbie. And you've invested so much of your life into gaining this information to the impact you've had on people around the world. And uh, it really and truly, uh, I hope that you come back to the podcast and share more of your own personal story and how we can help impact relationships between parent and child, kids with each other, you know, spousal relationships, significant relationships. I've had the luxury of, you know, hearing a message with see my kids through these lenses. You know, you're curious, are they left-handed or right-handed? And you yeah. should be just as curious as are they a knowledge structure, compassion or energy and, yeah. and creating a world that, that converts and that you can reach that common ground. I know that, you know, I have three kids and they're all very different and I've seen them through the lens of the human factor that you've created. And I'm thankful to you for that. Yeah, I want to say something to you from the moment I met you, that was significant. There was something significant about you. Lane, you speak people. You're a genius at bringing people together and bringing out the best in people. That's why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. You're not doing this for yourself. You're doing it for the universe because you can't help it. Thank and you. And I'm grateful that you allowed me to be a part of it. Thank you very much. You're so yeah. welcome. And you're right. I just can't help it. Okay. And I can't help but it really keeps me up at night figuring out how do we get this human factor to everybody because I truly believe that it will be a perfect world um, if people understood what it is, the gift that you've given us through this human factor. Um, so with that, and I'm thankful today that your grandson, Zan, is in the, in the studio and your wife, Anna, is here. And so they'll fact check all these stories. And, sure. uh, okay. you know, I know that uh, as a knowledge person, you know, you go deep and you really think deeply, but you have truly learned to bridge between uh, a compassion person and find a way to uh, support me, and I really appreciate it. So Whatever it takes for you, I'll do it. Nah, I know, I know. I caught you to get you here today, but I hope you come back. <laughs> yeah. I really think this is a great platform to get your message out there to more people. So all of our listeners out there, I want to. I hope you're as thankful as I am that you got to hear some of the words of Robbie Dotson and uh, that you will look for his book coming out next year and that you'll come back to the podcast and maybe hear some more words of wisdom from him. So uh, thank you so much, Robbie. And you, uh, you have truly helped us to go first. And I hope every listener out there will look around their life and look at those points of stress and those people who disrupt their sort of natural flow and think, hey, maybe they're just a knowledge person and I'm a compassion person, or maybe they're structure and I'm energy and I can go first to have a deeper understanding of of their values and why they operate the way they do. All right. So well, thank, thank you, you so much. And yeah, thank you, Robbie, for being here, everybody. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. I want to again thank Dr. Robbie Dotson for joining us on You Go First and sharing his insights. You can find him on his website at globalednetwork.com. Globalednetwork.com. He does not have an Instagram. But if you'd like to leave comments, you can do that at yougofirst.live in the comments section. Or if you're seeing this on the Odyssey team's Facebook, please leave a comment below and we'll forward those to Robbie or get right back to you. Thanks and make it a great day. Thanks for listening to another episode of You Go First. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to listen to another episode, you can find us at yougofirst.live or you can see more about our host, Lane Hensley, on his Instagram at One Dream Chaser. To learn more about his company, Odyssey Teams Inc., go to odysseyteams.com or follow all their social media channels at Odyssey Teams. Thanks again, and we hope that you will go first to share our podcast with a friend or colleague. Now, you go first. Don't forget to like us on the button below. Follow us by clicking the bell. You'll get all future episodes, as well as you can certainly find the podcast on the audio version everywhere where podcasts are found. So we're looking forward to the next episode. We've got a lot of really exciting guests coming up. Thanks for watching.